It's Sunday, April 25th, and this is For Good Reason. Welcome to For Good Reason. I'm DJ Grothy. For Good Reason is the radio show and the podcast produced in association with the James Randi Educational Foundation, an international nonprofit whose mission is to advance critical thinking about the paranormal, pseudoscience, and the supernatural. My guest this week is Deirdre Barrett. She is an evolutionary psychologist at Harvard Medical School's Behavioral Medicine Program and the author of a number of books, including Wasteland and Trauma and Dreams. She joins me on the show to talk about her new book, Supernormal Stimuli, How Primal Urges Overran Their Evolutionary Purpose. Professor Deirdre Barrett, welcome to the show. Hi, nice to be here. I loved your book. Let's start off by defining supernormal stimuli. These are the things what we experience in our daily lives that mimic triggers from our old evolutionary past. It's it's like we are reacting today like we're still living on the Serengeti, but instead we're in modern society. So all these old urges, they're kind of, you know, they, they're, they're not serving us anymore. Yes. The supernormal stimulus is simply an object that pulls an instinct more strongly than whatever that instinct evolved for, is naturally intended for. And it, it's a term that Nico Tinbergen coined in his animal behavior research, but animals only encounter supernormal stimulus when an experimenter builds one. He would build dummy eggs and vary the size and the color and the markings to demonstrate that he could make plaster eggs that a bird would prefer to sit on in preference to its own. Hmm. If the color was was a more intense shade of the natural color, if the markings were exaggerated, if the egg was bigger. But a bird isn't going to find brighter blue eggs with big black polka dots instead of little gray speckles sitting in its nest in nature, whereas now that humans have become so technological, we can make supernormal stimuli to cater to our instincts. So our world is just filled with them, and we head for them instead of the things that the, the instincts are pulling us toward. The, the old saying about just trust your instincts really doesn't apply in the modern world. You, you could trust your instincts if you were hunting and gathering on the African savanna. That's the setting for which they've evolved, but we haven't had time for them to fine-tune to our modern world. Mm. So uh, trusting your instincts today means that we could easily be deceived because the stuff that our instincts are pulled toward pull us much more than um, in our deep evolutionary history. Exactly. I mean, our food instincts are, are telling us, you know, look for salt. It used to be a very scarce commodity or get as much fat as you could because that was only going to be in meats and nuts, which were relatively rare, or eat sugar because that was only going to be in fruit, and get as many calories as you can because it was much easier to starve to death than, than to overeat in, in most of human evolution. So now our instincts are still telling us, eat as much fat and salt and sugar and calories as you can find, and, and now we can find just huge unnatural concentrations of them. So it would have paid off big time uh, when eating salts and fats and, and all the sugars and everything, sweets and fats, paid off in terms of a reproductive advantage when starvation was the norm. But it's backfiring on us now because, you know, people aren't starving. In fact, they're overeating. Obesity is the epidemic. Right. I mean, our instincts, our instincts lead us toward these supernormal stimuli more powerfully than toward the real things. I mean, it's not at all just food. It's Again, in our natural setting, if if something was cute and little and had short limbs and big eyes and was looking up at you to take care of it and making cute sounds, you know, you should be nurturing that. That was your child or possibly somebody else's in, in your tribe. And now it might be a pocket pet or an anime <laughs> character on television or a stuffed animal that's there with the... the big eyes and the wide open mouth and the cute little chubby short limbs. What's the problem if uh, people not only love the cute little babies, might provide some reproductive advantage, but also their cute little teddy bears? Um, I think that 
we we do have some energy and resources to spare these days. So for some pursuit of some supernormal stimuli, the only downside is just wasting our time and energy and resources. And and we probably have some of that to waste. So you know keeping, you know, cute pets of another species that we sort of bred to look especially babyish <laughs> compared to their, you know, wolf or wildcat ancestors. Right. You're speaking to me. I'm the owner of a puggle and that little face, you know, is endearing to everybody who comes over. I, I get what you're saying, but you're saying ultimately it could be a waste of time if it takes us from more important things. Yeah, it's certainly a waste of time from an evolutionary survival standpoint, but we can afford... We can afford to waste some time. So owning some stuffed animals or pocket pets or watching cute cartoons or <laughs> masturbating to the centerfold of a magazine rather than, you know, seeking out a real partner, we can do certain amounts of these and, and all it does is waste time and we've got some time to waste. But the extremes of doing lots of it instead of whatever the instinct is designed for is dangerous even with those instincts like nurturance and sexuality and mm. and friendships. But they're more quickly dangerous for some other kinds of instincts like our defensiveness and territoriality and aggressive instincts. When, when those get falsely stimulated, it can be deadly to pay attention to the supernormal stimuli. Before we get to those... Uh those kind of more destructive ways of paying attention to supernormal stimuli. Let's talk about porn. You mentioned it. Last night, Professor, I saw Avenue Q. I laughed at the song, The Internet is for Porn. And, and the song last night made me think of your book. You argue about porn in your book. You say that porn diverts the natural reproductive impulse and that some people actually favor porn over even being in relationships or, or maybe that their love of porn, what competes with their love of real people. That sounds to me really old-fashioned. Uh, it's not the kind of argument you expect to hear from an evolutionary psychologist. Um, well, I think it's almost inarguable that it competes for time. I, I don't think porn actually competes for love, although some romance stories, some people can become so absorbed in some sort of substitute uh, uh, social world uh, that it substitutes for for friendships and love. I, I think I think porn substitutes for for real sexuality. And if it substitutes once in a while, you know, in scarce times, uh, again, just like with owning stuffed animals, you know, that that are pulling your nurturance instinct, a little diversion of our natural instincts, we we can afford. But certainly, for for some people, pornography becomes. A big problem, and William James had this phrase where he said the the task of a psychologist is making the ordinary seem strange, mm. by which he meant that our own instincts are just so invisible to us, they just seem so natural and so intuitive that we never question them, and we therefore can't really think about human behavior very logically. And when Nico Tinbergen was making these supernormal stimuli for animal sexual instincts, he could build cardboard butterflies that a male butterfly would prefer to try mating with over a real female. If the, if the butterfly's cylinder had more defined stripes on the side or if it wiggled faster than the rhythm that a real female does, it didn't even have to have wings, and the male would be trying to mate with the cardboard cylinder instead of the, the real female wow. sitting next to it. And that just looks kind of ridiculous and stupid to us until you think that, I mean, not only those blow-up dolls that I think a minority <laughs> of, of males favor, but just the centerfolds of magazines are really not very different than the cardboard butterfly without wings. I mean, a, a six-inch flat, you know, two-dimensional image of a woman um, instead of a real woman is about as big a leap as that cardboard butterfly. So you're, you, you, you use the phrase porn as opposed to real sexuality. You're denying that enjoyment of porn is a way of being genuinely sexual it's it's artificial to you it's a substitute it's somehow fake um 
Well, of course, it's really sexual in terms of the physical sensations of that (laughs) individual. But from an evolutionary standpoint, from a reproductive standpoint, it's certainly not um, sexual in that most definitions of sex have to do with with interacting with another partner of the same species. Mm. Okay. Well, uh, it's a subject that fascinates me, not only because of the implications of your theory for, say, um, gay people and, you know, uh, their interests and all that stuff. But just because it, like I said, it doesn't sound like the argument you normally get from someone steeped in the evolutionary sciences. You hear, uh, something that could be interpreted as somewhat anti-porn from, you know, the, the, let's say the cultural competitors to the evolutionists, you know, the religious right or something like that. Yes. Well, actually, I mean, it's a good point when you mention, Gay people, because there certainly there's a distinction between much of what we do sexually is is not in an evolutionary sense forwarding our reproductive strategy. You wouldn't actually say that uh, like homosexuality is therefore a waste of time, uh, like uh, you know paying attention to teddy bears is a waste of time. No, um, I, I mean that. It, it, yeah, you make a very important point that human sexuality certainly serves a lot of other purposes besides reproduction, and our instincts are more around reproduction, but in today's world with basically overpopulation, we don't really want much less need to be reproducing as fast as we can. So certainly there are many kinds of sexuality that from an evolutionary standpoint are not achieving any reproductive goal. Gay sex certainly isn't. Um, Any sex with birth control certainly isn't. Mm -hmm. Any sex after the age of menopause isn't. Um, So from a reproductive standpoint, much of what we do is, is, you know, is not serving evolution. But human sexuality serves a lot of other purposes. It, It serves a lot of bonding, connecting, social cementing of of relationships kind of purposes Mm -hmm. and all of those other things that i just rattled off gay sex postmenopausal sex and sex with birth control are generally furthering all of those other things that human sexuality seems to have evolved to do whereas pornography doesn't seem to be um furthering any of those agendas you don't object to porn on moral grounds you just think that it's not as effective at serving our needs as these other ways of being sexual. Well, I'm I'm only categorizing it with uh, stuffed toys and television as a substitute for for more general social drives and and many other things as you know as in small quantities simply a waste of time and only really destructive in large quantities. I, I'm cheeseburgers mm-hmm. would fall in the same category. No, I certainly don't see it as a moral issue. Mm. I'd like to let our listeners know that you can get a copy of Supernormal Stimuli, How Primal Urges Overran Their Evolutionary Purpose, through our website, forgoodreason.org. Professor, one of the things I found confusing in your argument about supernormal stimuli, you'll help unpack this for me, is that you say one of the reasons we don't adopt, say, alternative energy as opposed to nuclear power is because of this desire we have to seek supernormal stimuli by pursuing stuff that gives us a lot of prestige and it's very difficult like like nuclear physics right it you know it has this payoff uh for all these evolutionary instincts to seek after prestige or or something do i have that right yeah, I've, I've literally heard physicists say that um, wind power and solar power are kind of fancy plumbing, and, you know, they might be good energy sources, but they're a little boring to work on, mm. whereas as nuclear and subatomic physics is just fascinating, and that that's at least one of the the reasons that we're busy building the Haldron Collider while making kind of modest progress toward harnessing wind power or solar power. So again, you're you're seeing the problems resulting from these supernormal stimuli as affecting really every area of our lives. The biggest challenges we face, you're saying, <laughs> has to do with supernormal stimuli. Yeah, I'm really saying most problems in modern civilization um, 
it, in one sense, results from some combination of our population density being way more than what our instincts evolve for, for our being stationary rather than nomadic these days, and, and most importantly, for our technological ability to build these supernormal stimuli and kind of reverse what instincts traditionally have done for all species, which is lead us toward particular objects that are good for us. As we developed technologically, we kind of stopped that process and reversed it so that instead of heading toward the natural objects that our instincts would pull us toward, we take the instincts and create an exaggeration of, of what they're desiring mm. and create the objects to cater the instincts. So you're, you're basically saying the way that we evolved doesn't serve us in our modern society. Um, one of the ways uh, I think this is evident, although you don't get into it in great depth in your book, I want to talk to you about it, though, is when it comes to things like belief in the paranormal or the supernatural. Listeners to this show know that we come at these topics with kind of a skeptical bent. Uh, you know, it's our position that there's not really a lot of good reason to buy into these claims, or at least that the evidence doesn't warrant accepting these claims, I mean. Does your notion about supernormal stimuli, does it help in any way to kind of explain why people believe in this sort of stuff despite the evidence? Uh, in other words, does believing in unsupportable claims, dowsing, past lives, psychics, ghosts, any of that stuff, UFOs, whatever, does believing in that stuff pay off in other ways designed by evolution, even though the stuff's not actually true? Like, it, it would have paid off on the savannah. Yeah, not right? paying off now for modern man, but is there in our in our instinctual repertoire because sort of its, its basic version paid off on the savannah. And so it's, it's not paying off now. Right. I mean, I don't talk explicitly in, in the book Supernormal Stimuli about beliefs in the, the paranormal and cryptozoology. But what I, what I do talk about that, that's extremely related is the popularity of and people's passion for things like horror films and mm -hmm. disaster films and, and, and sort of those fictional pretend um, you know, movies and television shows about the, their paranormal. Right. And, and I think that supernormal stimuli explains that sort of thing as just an exaggeration of some of the things that, that we're coded to look for and pay attention to. I mean, one thing is we're just coded to pay attention and try to make meaning out of, of all kinds of events. So when we make errors, it's going to be sort of seeing meaningful connections where there may actually be randomness. Um, it, it was more dangerous to miss a real connection, you know, a meaningful thing that was coming, you know, by someone's intent than than to, to overinterpret that. It's better in, in our evolutionary past for us to connect dots between things that don't actually exist than to be wrong about that movement over there in the grass, which is actually a tiger or something. Exactly. To, to you know, to, to see human intent in something that's actually a random movement or to see a big, scary animal when it actually isn't there. I mean, one type of mistake is more dangerous than the other. So, so we're, we're geared to make one more often. I, I talk about connecting the dots. I want to connect the dots between that kind of believing in unseen causes, right? And translate that to the here and now. So if someone in our evolutionary past goes up to a big mountain, he feels yeah, this sense of awe or something. Well, that we can explain that. Maybe evolutionary psychology can explain that, you know, uh, the, the numinous or whatever, and, and uh, the juxtaposition of the ordinary, and that's very uh, unique and special, and, you know, or, or maybe oceans or whatever. You know, the, like these things in nature that give us that sense of awe, maybe eventually resulting in religion. Well, now um, we don't need to go and feel this superstitious reaction when we see something unexplainable, right? It doesn't serve us anymore. Is there anything that we could do to rebel against these supernormal stimuli? Well, I think that the thing we need to do with any kind of supernormal stimuli, whether it's whether it's the the junk food or the television sitcoms or the porn or the cute stuffed animals, is or the nonsense beliefs. Yeah, or or the beliefs in supernatural things or odd animals that evidence does not support or whatever, that that 
beginning to question these things is the first step that that people do too much just want to trust their instincts. If it sort of feels intuitively right, they want to go with it. And the same way that you just can't do that in today's food environment. You know, we're pulled more toward a cheeseburger than we are toward green leafy vegetables because the salt and fat used to be harder to find and the the leafy vegetables used to be easier to find. Um, that that we do have these giant brains to override that, but the first step is, is this thing William James called, you know, making the ordinary seem strange, to just stop and question, mm. um, is this what I need to be doing or thinking or pursuing, and sort of use our brain instead of just trusting our instincts. And I, I think it's the same way with, um, you know, hearing there's been a UFO in the sky last night or somebody tells a ghost story or, um, you know, or there's some story of dinosaurs still roaming this patch of wood, Mm -hmm. that our our ancestral thing, I mean, if you heard about some super strong, super powerful, super canny human, you know, that had ill intent out there and you didn't pay attention to that, you you might have died if you heard about some, you know, new predatory animal moving into your territory that you hadn't known about before and you went, eh, you know, I have never <laughs> seen one of those, probably don't exist. You may have died. Skepticism didn't provide an evolutionary advantage. Yeah, it, definitely. If you if you were going to make a mistake, it was it should be in the direction of taking these reports seriously and, you know, acting as if they were true and until you know radically proven untrue Mm -hmm. so so that's what feels intuitively right we can just we can hear the most hearsay improbable thing and especially if it's either got some awesome powerful positive figure in the story or if it's got some kind of supernaturally powerful evil intended human or humanoid or if it's got some ferocious animal or dramatic exotic animal in the story it's like oh wow and and you know the default is to believe it mm-hmm. so again just starting to question that impulse you know is this just cuz i sort of want to for some irrational reason or does this really really make sense is the first step to starting to use your brain rather than trust your instincts. But that first step, using your brain rather than trusting your instincts, you're actually suggesting that it's fighting evolution itself when we go up against, you know, the supernormal stimuli or the automatic reflex to be credulous. With our technology, we've already upset evolution terribly, this idea that Instead of just letting our instincts lead us to something, we now make things to cater to the instincts. Mm. That's where we've sort of, you know, taken evolution off course. But but the more we can trust our intellect instead of trust our instincts, the more we can sort of think out what, you know, what we should be heading toward, um, Mm. the way our instincts would be leading us if we were in our natural environment. Uh, but you're suggesting that the kind of modern world is not our natural environment. In fact, you're going further than that. You're saying most problems in modern civilization result from the supernormal stimuli being evident in this unnatural environment. So, uh, I mean, you're not calling for us to all just go back and live in the woods or something, but you do say – uh, you finish up your book by arguing we need to reorganize society to be more compatible with how we turned out through evolution or how we were designed by evolution, is your phrase. Um, to take the example from belief, um, well, we may have evolved to believe in ghosts or you know unseen causes, all that stuff, and and we might not have actually evolved to believe in science or you know to kind of understand the riddles of the universe. You're not saying that we should go back to what we've evolved to be, though, right? Um, I think it's almost a moot question. I mean, with our current population, we we couldn't live a hunting-gathering lifestyle as opposed to an agricultural one. We just couldn't roll back our technology or our population level. So whether we should is is just sort of 
it's an interesting philosophical question, but it's not a it's not a very practical one. We're we're obviously going to live with a lot of the the modern relatively unnatural to you know to our evolved instincts. Of course, but world. you're but you're saying we need to reorganize society to be more compatible with with our instincts. Yeah. In as much as we can change the world around us so that our instincts will automatically lead us toward healthy things. That would be great. I think with some things like our food environment, mm-hmm. that that we really could do that. You know, if if we just outlawed trans fats and advertising <laughs> junk food to children and taxed most of the other less healthy refined foods heftily, like we we do some other addictive substances and subsidize growing broccoli rather than growing corn syrup as we do now, that that we could really shift it around to just the food environment that would be around you would would not be nearly as as bad for your health as it is right now. And that would make it easier. I think an individual can struggle with willpower and eat right even in our current food environment. But but back to the idea of of false beliefs, um, I certainly don't think that we want to legislate away the um, rather ludicrous beliefs that float around in our current <laughs> environment. Certainly, certainly our population densities and our technology has made it such that anytime anyone comes up with a you know compelling odd story that infinitely more human beings will hear it than than would have at some point in the past and believe in it as yeah, a yeah and and believe get all excited about it and believe in it but but just you have to hear about it in the first place to, mm-hmm. to even mm-hmm. potentially believe in it so i think that's why some of these movements are magnifying and i don't think that most of us want to reengineer our environment to not allow improbable stories to circulate. So I I think that that that's one we're maybe going to change less, although I think it's certainly a positive change that, at least in America right now, it seems to be becoming somewhat more permissible to kind of say, that's ridiculous, that isn't logical, let's you know, let's think about that in response to religious ideas and mm-hmm. paranormal ideas mm-hmm. and, and anything else than it might have a generation or two ago for religious ideas, at least. But even if that's going against our kind of evolutionary heritage, you think it's a worthwhile project? And it sounds like you're a little optimistic it might actually make a dent in this, um, you know, in this way that we were designed by evolution. Yeah, I mean, the the huge difference between humans and almost any of these other species that, that Tinbergen was studying with supernormal stimuli is, is we do have this giant cortex that is rather specifically designed to override our basic instincts and reason out other specific behaviors in particular settings where our simple instincts would, would lead us astray. And so the, the bird has got this giant bright blue black polka dotted egg there and is ignoring its little pale blue gray dappled egg in preference to it just can't get off the bright blue egg it the, is the fake egg for it. Yeah. fake egg over and over and over it's bluer it its spots are spottier it's bigger it just looks better to the bird and you know no matter how many times it slides off this giant egg it's just going to hop back on and keep ignoring its own egg. But human beings do have this ability to go, oh my God, I'm sitting on a fake bright blue plaster egg. This isn't really my egg. I can get off of this thing. I really ought to be, you know, nurturing my own offspring. So we really can do something different in that situation. But the trick is just realizing that the artificial situation exists. It feels so natural to us you know, our equivalent of the giant blue egg that we just so often don't question, you know, oh, this just feels like good food. Of course we'd eat it. Or, you know, of course we want to sit in front of a box of wires watching laugh tracks for half hour after half hour 
instead of having a conversation with a real human being. We we just kind of don't question why we're pulled toward most of these things. Mm. But your your message is, hey, I'm sitting on this polka dotted plaster egg. Why don't I, you know, climb off? Yes, I think that just is sort of reading about even the animal research that Tenbergen did, the concept of supernormal stimuli, once you really get it, has a very you, you just start seeing it everywhere in your environment. And it has a very powerful sort of wake up message to shake you out of some of these bad habits. Mm. Professor Deirdre Barrett, thank you very much for our discussion. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. And now, in this week's installment of The Honest Liar, we compare a $20 street scam with a billion-dollar crime. Here's Jamie Ian Swiss. $65 billion. That's how much Bernie Madoff took his victims for. $65 billion. To understand the mysteries of Monty or Madoff, you first have to credit the con man. In 1920, Charles Ponzi created a financial scam that bears his name today. For a short time, at least, his scheme became nothing less than a craze. Ponzi brought in millions of 1920 dollars in less than a year's time. And also within that same year, Ponzi's con collapsed, and he would eventually go to prison for it twice. Eighty-eight years after Ponzi's stroke of evil genius, Bernard Bernie Madoff was arrested on December 11, 2008, for operating the biggest Ponzi scheme in history, having built his victims out of an estimated $65 billion, enough to fund the American war in Afghanistan for a full year. Since pleading guilty last year, Madoff is currently serving a 150-year sentence, the maximum allowable term for his crimes. Although much still remains unknown or is yet publicly unexplained about the details of Madoff's crimes, there is speculation that Madoff was engaged in his systematic thievery since at least the early 1990s, and possibly since as much as a decade before that. How could Bernie Madoff have operated successfully for so long and still have been bringing in new investors, that is, victims, literally within days of his self-planned arrest? In last week's installment, I explained how, in the example of the ancient street scam known as Three Card Monty, the method is not the trick. The sleight-of-hand maneuver that switches two cards in the Monty game is a useless device without the psychology, the theater, without the emotional confidence the operator instills in his mark. The same was true for Bernie Madoff, whose victims number in the thousands, from elderly widows to massive banking institutions. Bernie Madoff's greed and pathology would have gotten him nowhere without the psychology of his affinity scheme, a deadly game that built trust based on tribalism, created desire based on the perception of exclusivity, built confidence with primitive monthly statements printed on dot matrix printers, mailed to widows and financial titans alike, that detailed the stocks and securities they owned, when in fact they owned nothing of the sort. And we're inside tour of the three card Monty last week demonstrated how hard the operator works in order to take your money. I pointed out how the grifter works with specialized skills that he's mastered over countless repetitions. His sleight of hand skills are in fact the very least of his arsenal. His real weapons are those of psychological manipulation and outright deception. Weapons that have been honed and handed down by generations of con men before him. Deception is his specialty and it's my specialty as well. In my own reading of the Madoff Ponzi scheme, it is abundantly clear to me that Bernie Madoff worked hard to bilk his clients and, quote, friends of billions of dollars. The vaguely sympathetic notion that has been put forward by some that Madoff was somehow hoping to make up for some early losses and eventually return to an honest accounting is ludicrous. Although it might be conceivable that the fraud began in order to protect his ego and conceal some legitimate investment losses, any such intentions had to have faded rapidly from his motives and vanished a very long time ago, along with any sense of human decency or empathy for his wiped-out victims. Madoff knew, sooner not later, that he could not recoup what he was taking from people, and he took money in bad, very bad, faith. He was still taking money from elderly widows within weeks of his eventual arrest, and had it not been for the economic crash of September 2008, Madoff would certainly have tried to keep the scam going indefinitely for as long as he possibly could.
We do know that Madoff kept his Ponzi scheme physically and factually isolated away from his other legitimate operations and employees, literally on another floor of the famed lipstick building that housed his offices on 3rd Avenue at East 53rd Street in Manhattan, a building I have walked by literally countless times in my life. Madoff, with the help of how many co-conspirators we still do not fully know, regularly generated false statements of income to his clients, which in turn, by the way, his clients paid taxes on. Unlike Charles Ponzi, Madoff kept the returns on his clients' investments reasonable, between 8 and 14 percent, albeit the fact that he never experienced downturns, even in the down economy, raised warning flags to a few attentive experts. He used feeder funds as layers of protection and obfuscation and rewarded managers of those funds for sending investors his way. And he actively solicited business on an ongoing and aggressive basis, making his investment funds seem all the more attractive, not only by way of its apparent safety and steady, seemingly conservative profitability, but because of the carefully manufactured and maintained illusion of exclusivity. By turning away the occasional investor with apparent arrogance and disregard, I don't need your money, he was known to declare to prospects with too many questions, Madoff helped to build his myth, and by so doing, built the desirability of his fund. Bernie Madoff is a criminal, a con man, a predator, and an expert deceiver who worked hard to maintain his deceptions. I often remind my audiences that being fooled is not the same as being a fool. As a professional magician, I don't get paid merely to fool the stupid, the greedy, or the gullible. On the contrary, I get paid to fool smart, observant, reasoning people who are immediately aware they are likely to be fooled since they know I'm a magician. It would be foolish to attribute the effectiveness of a magic trick on the stupidity or inclination toward gullibility of my audiences. Indeed, the fact that we magicians work as hard as we do to create effective illusions is actually yet another psychological method of magic in and of itself. So when dealing with professionals, magician, Monty, or Madoff, it would be a mistake to blame the victim of a card trick, a con game, or a billion-dollar Ponzi scheme. To blame the victim offers no genuine insight and teaches us little about what has occurred. I once knew a professional magician who was taken in by the venerable Jamaican tourist con standing right in front of Grand Central Station, a scam in which the chief lure is nothing more than altruism. What does that teach us? Yet in the immediate aftermath of the Madoff affair, there were no shortage of voices ready to blame the victims of Madoff's predations. New York Times business columnist Joe Nocera addressed the Madoff case for the first time on March 13, 2009, almost three months to the day after Madoff's arrest, with a piece that was topped with this headline, Madoff had accomplices, his victims. No confusion there. On June 29th, Nocera's headline was, Madoff's victims, get over it. By July 4th, however, even Mr. Nocera had to back away from some of his more Scrooge-like inclinations. Are there no workhouses? Are there no prisons? As more and more stories came to light of the devastation left in Madoff's wake. Quote, the victims of Bernard L. Madoff, who was sentenced to 150 years in prison on Monday for his heinous financial crimes, deserve our sympathies, wrote Nocera. And he continued... And ever since Mr. Madoff's Ponzi scheme was revealed, the victims' lives have taken heartbreaking turns. Cancer patients who can no longer afford their treatments. People whose retirements have been destroyed. Elderly parents who've had to move in with their children. Mr. Nocera may have changed his tune, but he was far from alone in his tendency to blame the victim. Madoff sympathizers, for lack of a better term, want to believe that he somehow backed into becoming a con man, trying to make up for some market reversals. This is yet another version of blame the victim, however, based on the failure of the imagination that one experiences when trying to grasp the enormity, the monstrosity that Madoff is. A former special agent with the FBI who constructed behavioral profiles, Greg O. McCrary, was quoted in the Times comparing Madoff to a serial killer. Quote, some of the characteristics you see in psychopaths are lying, manipulation, the ability to deceive, feelings of grandiosity, and callousness toward their victims. Close quote. That grandiosity, the power of life and death, the power of a god, applies to Madoff as much as to a serial killer, according to McCrary. He adds... Madoff is getting the same thing. He's playing financial god, ruining these people, and taking their money. There are valid lessons to be drawn from the Madoff disaster, the failed responsibilities of the SEC and other regulators notwithstanding, that penetrate beneath the shallow gloss of greed and stupidity. 
These are lessons that magicians have long sought to teach to skeptics, scientists, academics, and investors alike, and continue to demonstrate every day in our work. For, after all, we do not get paid merely to fool the stupid. Lesson one is this. Anyone can be fooled. The moment you think you can't, you're lining up to be the next victim. And lesson two is that before we blame the victim, we must, first and always, credit the con man. My name is Jamie Ian Swiss, and I am The Honest Liar. Thanks for listening to this episode of For Good Reason. For updates throughout the week on the kinds of topics we cover on this show, find me on Twitter and on Facebook. To get involved with an online conversation about today's show, join the discussion at forgoodreason.org. Views expressed on For Good Reason aren't necessarily the views of the JREF, and questions and comments about today's show can be sent to info at forgoodreason.org. For Good Reason is produced by Thomas Donnelly and recorded from St. Louis, Missouri. Our music is composed for us by Emmy Award-nominated Gary Stockdale. Contributors to today's show included Jamie Ian Swiss and Christina Stevens. I'm your host, DJ Grothy. Grothy.